on undoable architectures. Since the beginning, sorry for my English. I am Italian, so be patient with me. Tutto bene. Tutto bene. Grazie. If you don't understand me, just ask again, and I will repeat, repeat. At the end, I can write code, so we will understand. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk to, to, uh, tonight about undoable architectures. Where undoable doesn't mean that you cannot do it, but that you can revert the decision that you, they, you did before. So, about me. Well, I'm Italian. I'm a technical leader and agile coach. I'm a front-end developer. I'm very passionate to TDD. There is, some guy, there, are, there is a guy here that can tell you how painful it is to work with me because no code without any test first. I work on a mobile, mobile develop, as a mobile developer since 2007. I touched a lot of technologies. Right now, most of my job is with uh, Cordova and iOS. I am very enthusiastic about technology. I am mentor and at airpair.com. But let me spend one second about the next event. It's not a book up event, but you are more than welcome to join us. It's a Scotch streaming and scaling. So if you don't care about programming, as you do, uh, you probably care about Scotch. So let's come with us and let's drink together until night. <coughs> <laughs> Today, we are going to speak about monolithic applications, how to identify very quickly modules and components of our, our application, and an easy or less painful way to distribute these models in your organization. We will talk a little bit about models, because right <coughs> now the models are the <coughs> biggest concern of every client-side application, and we will have also them. And thankfully, the demo works. Monolithic applications. So, first of all, we have what is a monolithic application? It's an application that is so big, so huge, that it's just a pain to start to think about this application. And it's even a bigger pain to start to work with this application. Most of enterprise applications are very monolithic. Why? Because sometimes we have a, a very huge code base that was already existing and some legacy code with bad practices. Uh, probably this application is done in this bad way because the organization cannot have the, enough time to, uh, to put it on the market. It's prototype based. This is a real story. There are companies that do their business about prototypes that are growing, 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 and potentially they will collapse, hopefully soon. <laughs> there is no plan in front of this application, of this enterprise application. They just start to grow. And there is no strategy, there, are, there is no vision, and they are just adapting to marketing needs, not so much to the user needs. Medium-sized applications can be monolithic too. Mm, you can get an unexpected success, and so you have to start to create new features because the market is asking you about this. You have budget constraints. How many of you uh, found yourself in a condition when you want to uh, refactor some code, do, it, do something better, and the customer or the organization say, hey, we don't have budget to this. I would. <laughs> Millions of times. <laughs> Missing expertise. OK, so this is typical. You start to use something that is cool. Angular, backbone, amber, I don't care. But at the end, you start to use it, you create your first application, and when you start to use it, you start to learn it. So you do millions of mistakes at the backbone of your application, and you bring with yourself. You adapt too much to customer needs, and not just to the, to the market. It's not bad to adapt to customer needs, to talk with the customer, 
But when a customer is asking something that makes no sense and destroy what you did in the past few months, you have to be brave and say no. Otherwise, you will have a very bad source code base. Code base. And yeah, as I said, the last kid on the block. So hey, there is, there is React.js. So it's cool. Let's do that with React.js. OK, you have enough expertise about it. What's in common? There is a lack of design, and there are no iterations <coughs> on this design, and there is no separation of concern. So you get this. You get this weird application, monolithic. You turn around your, this application, you look, and you don't understand. You don't understand how things work. You just fix bugs or you add features, just making them working, but without understanding too much. Which are the major problems? Maintainability. It's a pain to maintain an application like this. Scalability. OK, yeah. You can scale, but not as you expect. Not if your application starts to be from 1,000 users to 2,000 in six months. The learning curve, it's hard. This is another true story. If you start to work in a very so, in a very old code base, you spend at least the first month of your new job just to try to understand what's going on. So when the learning curve is so hard, <coughs> it's a problem, a huge problem. Difficult setups. In my previous company, I spent one day and a half to do the setup of the project. There is people that spent more than two weeks, right? <laughs> When uh, the code is so monolithic, you have problems to release. Uh, you cannot release often. You cannot release in QA. You cannot check your code. It's very difficult to test everything. And you have nightmares to integrate your new code base or the new feature with the existing one. There are solutions. There is still open. You can refactor. You can start to document your code. You can start to decouple the components and start to create a more maintainable code base. And you can move the model on the server. You can add computation capabilities in order to be faster, or to deploy faster, or to have a build cycle that takes seconds or minutes rather than 20 minutes, and so on. But be, be, be very careful. If you don't fight a monolithic application since the beginning, since the day one, the, the first day that you look to the code and say, hey, this is a nightmare, you will find yourself without an escape, closer, in a very nice environment where you can uh, work lazily and do nothing special. <laughs> Thankfully, there are modules and components that can help you to create a different kind of applications, or even better, to create the same bullshit, but in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> and the important thing is that uh, this different way makes your life easier and make your make feel yourself better when you start to work. An application module is a class that represents a business application task. Pretty cool definition. It's from Oracle. What's a component? A component is a reusable programming building block that can be combined with other components. OK, that's great. That's from Wikipedia or something like that. That's all good. Let's start, <laughs> let's start to, to think about this. <laughs> if models and components are good, why our code sometimes it's a mess? I'm not saying that all the code in the world is a mess. And I'm not saying that it's easy to keep our code well organized. But come on, 80% of the time we can refactor. 50% of the time, it's a mess. We have to start to identify our component since the beginning. So we have to spend time analyzing the requirements and understand which can be the, the components that can be so small and decoupled to be reused across different applications. And you can, uh, we can also iterate across our modules and components every time that the new features come on our backlog in order to understand if we already did this. It happened to me once that I found 15 different calendars implementation. Custom. Plus three widgets <laughs> from jQuery, one from Angular, and the other one was from Ken.js. So, okay. 
I'm not saying you are not working or not working well, but the, the people that created this application was not spending enough attention to what they are doing. So we have to, to, to think about this. And we have to pick the right tool set to implement a specific feature. We want to use Angular, yes, why? We want to use Ember, why? Don't start to use a, a, a library just because it's the last thing or it's the cool thing or it's where you can find the, your next job. Never reinvent the wheel and be always ready to share your components and models with the community. It can be your enterprise, the company where you work on, or the open source community. community. Let's talk about distributing models. It's another problem. So when you want to, to distribute a model you, or your or a component, first of all, it should be easy to install. Then the dependency management of each component should be automated or easy to maintain, not a big pain. The features of every model have to be very, very, very clear. And all the release of a model, a component, have to be available. So you can use Bower or NPM today. Who use Bower? Who use NPM? OK. So we are at home. But what's about your privacy? So everybody knows NPM and Bower like a way to create <coughs> components, modules, whatever, and just share them and install from a public repository. This is nice. It's great. I love it. But it's not something that is easy to make uh, uh, happening with a enter big enterprise. With Bauer, you can create uh, a component and you can use a private Git repo or GitHub repo or point to a private Git server. So that's very easy. With NPM, it's easy too. You can ask to npmjs.com a pricing, a quote about the enterprise service, or you can use uh, Synopia. Synopia is a, a great NPM model that allows you to create your own NPM repository on your server. In this way, you can keep safe the privacy of your models. And when you're using it, when you're using it, you use NPM as always, you just change the registry. Changing the registry from the private one to the public one, you can switch between two words and search components. Install them, get the dependencies, have an idea of the description, and so on. Which are the, the, the big benefits, the results that you, you get with this uh, approach? You can install and install components very easily, because you can use Bower and NPM. The dependency management process is kind of automated. And every component model can be unplugged from your application and changed. You can decide to remove a specific widget and add a new one. The source code starts to be very well organized. If you start to decouple everything in single, small, reusable component, then this is the key. You have small repositories. You have uh, small parts of your application that live by themselves. And these help you also in another important phase of your development cycle. When a new developer starts to work with you, instead of knowing everything about this application and these thousands of folders, okay, they can start to learn piece by piece. What's missing? The model. So that's nice, but we still don't have handled in any way the model. And uh, let's start about Let's start to talk about hypermedia models. The first thing that you have to do is to abstract the model. So keep the model outside of the application, outside of the client-side logic, and use whatever, form, whatever format you prefer. JSON and XML are both valid. I prefer JSON. There is someone that prefer XML. No, so everybody likes JSON. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and then you can use different data adapters. Backbone, Amber, uh, Angular, all the major client-side uh, client-side uh, client libraries offer to you adapters that can get a JSON file, uh, populate your model, you can then save, update, put, you can do whatever you want. 
But don't forget to enrich this model. A JSON file, it's not enough. A JSON object, it's not enough. You can specify the links, the head of every single object. You can specify <laughs> the body. You can send data. But you can also specify what's next or deliver your rules. You can say, hey, for this, for this model, I need these validation rules. Hey, for this other part of my application, I want to be able to update my application live. And this is the WebSocket URL that you have to use. You can enrich your models with additional information that help you to create the AnyPerMedia API. That it's very nice and fashion term, but makes sense if you use it wrong. Don't define a model that fits the needs of a specific library. Otherwise, you are trapped. You are you cannot escape from your decision. The point here is that every time you start an application, you decide a strategy, libraries, tools. If you make the wrong, if you make the wrong decision, you will pay in one year, two years. Let's say you are lucky, three years. Then you have to start from scratch or to close your company. <laughs> Try to, do, to don't depend only on a single client-side library. Don't be too lazy. I know good developers are lazy and automate things, but don't automate your brain. Think. Start to think to JavaScript as a mature language. ECMA 5, it's mature enough. ECMA 6, it's ready to go. So we have all the tool set that we need in order to start to work with ECMA 6 and to start with JavaScript and to complete all the tasks that are usually done by external libraries. Write clean and extendable and testable code. Oh yeah, okay. <coughs> Try always to consider which is the scope of your component. Most of the time, the scope is the biggest problem that we have. We can have namespace collisions, libraries collisions, whatever. Right now, web components offer a scope for CSS. I'm not sure, I don't think that we will have a scope for JavaScript too. So we still have to rely a little bit on iframes. But don't start to think to, to iframe <coughs> as a bad thing or uh, don't don't start to abuse of iframes. Let me show you a quick demo. Okay. Wow. Sorry. Let's you can see something? Yeah. Okay. So this is a small form where I can add a new person. Rigo is the volunteer. You can raise your hand. <laughs> he's 31. He is kindly in Boston. And he's a man. Okay. I'm adding a user. The list is updated. Nothing special. And now. <coughs> Also, this other small uh, square is updated. The point is that this is done with Angular. This is Backbone, and this is Ember. So they live together on the same page in iframes. And when I update the model and I get the success from the, from the server, using a socket, I communicate with this other iframe and say, hey, Something is changing in the model. Ask again to the server the fresh data. And when I click on the name and I want to get the, the detail of the user info, I am instead simply updating the local storage. I am updating the local storage, say, saying that uh, the current user is Rico, and my Ember model is updated with the relevant information. If I change this, then information are changing. 
<coughs> so not rocket science in place. Just uh, small ideas. We have the iframes. You can read something. Let me switch to probably here you can read something more. So we have an application that has some components. In the components, we have an Angular application. We have an Ember application. And then we have, in user list, a backbone application. All of them include, from the main app, the socket IO client application, cl client library. From every of these, from every file, you can get the, you can get the information about this. Here it's connecting to the socket, and when I get the message, I can update the client, <coughs> and in the backbone user list, I can detect when the user, yeah, when the user add event or message has been dispatched from the server, I clean up the table and I fetch again the data from the server. That's it. On the server side, it's a small application where I just have express running, just because uh, I have uh, a backup of the of the application itself it is this one. I'm sorry for the for the resolution. Much better maybe right now. So I use Mongo and I simply instantiate, start to instantiate socket and I detect the events that are sent from the client. And then I send back to the to the to the to the other component. If you take a look to the console log you see in fact that client has connected to the server and this is the socket client received a user add message from the server and Rico is the new user and uh, these are the objects that are serialized and deserialized in order to update the, the local storage <coughs> and actually that's it If you want to take a look to the <coughs> to the source code, everything is on the GitHub, slides, source code, everything else. These are a list of resources that can help you to uh, have a better overview about uh, these problems. And this is my Twitter account, and if you have any question, I'm here. No? No question? <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>
entities with CRUD, and this one is student driven. The question is uh, how I reconcile the WebSocket model with the, web, the RESTful model. I'm not using WebSocket to handle the model, just to notify the different components about something that is changing. I always rely on RESTful or Hybrid Media API for the model. Other questions? Okay, the question is why I don't rely about WebSocket on the model. Uh, not because I don't rely on WebSocket, but because I prefer to have a JSON enriched model with data and what's next, uh, formatting rules, validation rules, and it's more convenient to me to have it in a JSON file, in a JSON AP, let's say, yeah, in a JSON output that it's usable also from different contexts, like a mobile application based on iOS or something different. Yeah. Uh, with the iframe model, uh, do you run into collisions ever because they're so separate? Whereas a lot of a lot of other people are using a framework that allows you to have sort of virtual iframes that, but there can be crosstalk between them. Well, the, the question is about collisions with uh, iframe. I usually use it in an application identifier between iframes in order to communicate on the client side and in the socket. In this way, I avoided uh, collisions because in the event that it's supposed to go to a specific component, it's identified by the ID of the component. Yeah? Uh, I, sockets and, um, and Cordova, and sockets and, how, how does that work? Sockets and Cordova, they work great together. They do? Yeah. Nice. Other questions? You can take a look to cross, cross, Crosswalk. Crosswalk is an open source project that bring uh, uh, the, um, Chrome, the JavaScript engine, and all the API into Cordova for Android, and it's coming also to iOS. Crosswalk. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Thanks, guys. We may or may not have lost the television in the back. We're good? Yeah. Everything is going according to plan. So a couple other things. Do you guys make websites? Do you have bugs on your websites? Did you know that we run an open device lab that you might test your websites? and find new and exciting bugs that will become your job. So if you've ever wanted to create a dozen tiny chores for yourself, but also made a really good website across a bunch of devices, come in and use our device lab. I'm no carpenter, but it looks like it was hewed by hand by a master craftsman. I bet he was handsome. <laughs> the next thing to know is that I am still mad at the New Yorkers who have put me up here. We now have a hashtag. The Twitter account is BOS underscore JS. Make a ton of noise. Tell them how much fun you're having without them. This is great. This is the most organized JavaScript meetup any of you have ever been to, and it's all thanks to the guy whose shirt literally says lowbrow on it. I am ill prepared. I don't have speaker notes. So if you're anything like me, um, you started hearing about promises when you were hired at Boku about six months ago. Um, it is without question the new hotness, but just how new is said new hotness? Here to give us a brief history of promises, Evelyn Leon. Yay.
Okay. Awesome. Hi, I'm Evelyn. Um, I am here to talk about promises. They're really old. They've actually been around almost as long as I've been alive, which is crazy. Um, let me first talk about, so I first started really working with JavaScript back in like 2010. Um, it's when I started working with jQuery and picking up Ajax, and it was great. Um, a lot of the stuff that I wrote ended up looking kind of like this, and I, one of my coworkers actually had a really fun name for it. He called them rainbows, um, because it just became this with a bunch of closing braces at the end. Um, and then in about 2012, she got this because I'm talking about it. Um, jQuery released deferreds, and everyone was like, this is amazing. This is the greatest thing ever, because now you can write stuff that looks like this. Um, you no longer have to have these rainbows of gets all over the place. You can put them all in one place, you can put them together, you can say, when this get is done, do all this other stuff. And you don't have to keep nesting these callbacks again and again and again and again. Um, this implementation wasn't perfect. Uh, there was a lot of other stuff happening at the time, um, but I'll get into that later when I kind of reach that point in the timeline. Um, for people who aren't aware, the way JavaScript works is that it's a single-threaded process. Um, only one thing can ever happen at a time, and you have to wait for all this stuff to finish before you can get to your thing. You can't jump into the middle of the queue and like do something else. Um, and so the way that promises and futures work is that they essentially just drop stuff on the end of the queue when you are ready for them. Um, and you put a function there and say, hey, when you're done, when you get to this point in the queue, call me. Um, and it kind of just works like that. Uh, each browser kind of implements this differently in terms of how it deals with queuing. Um, but yeah, so that's how promises work, and that's why we even need promises, because we don't really have multi-threading. You can't just like run off somewhere and do something else and then come back. Um, so to start, we're going to go back to about 1992, um, to like the early, early days of the internet, where there was Usenet. And Usenet was great. You could post things, people could read them. Um, one of the problems was that the early clients and the early servers, they worked in terms of batch processing. So you'd fire up a process, it would run off and be like, hey, do you have anything new for me? And then kind of shut down and like walk away and then come back later and then do it again. Um, and so, Back in 1992, Rich Sauls released IIN, um, or INN. And this is like the early version of a blog post. They released the paper. Uh, <laughs> this actually keeps happening up until like the, about the 2000s when people start writing blog posts instead of releasing papers, and this kind of just goes away. Um, it does not go away. Who reads them? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's kind of the problem, right? Like, who actually goes out there and reads? papers about things when you can just read a blog post. The readers go away. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Rich Stalls introduces Internet News, which, like, the key piece of it is the INN daemon, which kind of sits there and waits. Um, it, it basically is polling in the background, but every time an event comes in, it fires off a bunch of processes that basically act like uh, promises, features. Um, they have event handlers. They handle the event that comes in. Um, and that kind of sets the stage for promises as we move forward. Um, the next kind of interesting thing that happens is in 1995 when JavaScript gets released. Um, it's also the year that Toy Story is released, which is crazy. Like, it's that long ago now. Um, but that's when we first start seeing uh, some of the stuff getting talked about more. Um, so, Douglas Schmidt writes a paper about event handling and distributed kind of networks and things like that, um, and writes this whole, he basically coins the React uh, pattern uh, that talks about event-driven architectures and how if you have, you kind of just wait for an event to come in and you perform an action based on it. Um, it's pretty basic. But that's where it starts off. Um, and in the same year, Sam Rushing uh, of Nightmare Software, he 
writes this library called Medusa. Um, and this is the first time that this code appears in Python. He writes Medusa, he writes async core to support Medusa. Um, and it's a asynchronous event-driven server platform. Um, it works off of sockets, it pulls the sockets, and so right now we still have this framework of promises that's still very much tied to input and output. Um, it's still tied to the fact that you have sockets, you're pulling them all the time. Um, but this, this is kind of a critical point in the promise history. Um, this, the async core stuff that he writes is so fundamental that it eventually gets included in Python 1.5.2 in 1999 um, and is still there today. And it becomes kind of like the, the kernel of what comes next. Um, so in 2001, Glyph Lefkowitz, which I'm not entirely sure if that's his real name or not, um, he goes by this symbol on the internet and he has this whole blog post explaining like what each little piece means. Um, and the, the, the amount of detail that goes into that makes me want to believe that his real name isn't actually Glyph, but that's how he is known everywhere on the internet. So maybe he changed it to that. Um, but he writes Twisted. And this is a, another network-driven architecture. But it, it's a framework that exists outside of the kind of in-out paradigm. It no longer relies on sockets. It no longer relies on polling. Um, it kind of takes the promise and future idea and like encapsulates itself into its own little class. Um, so you have kind of the first instance of a deferred. And one of the really important things to note here is that it has an armed variable that it just kind of hangs onto by itself. Um, and it has a call variable. And it uses those to figure out if this thing has been, if it's done and if it should be called or not. Um, and this is the first time this happens. Every, up until now, what it's been doing, what futures have been doing are kind of pulling and just checking to see if there's anything new on the socket. Um, this is the first time it's kind of, kind of encapsulated into its own little class and kind of generalized and no longer really tied to the network architecture. This is Bob Ippolito, and in 2005, he released MochiKit to power MochiBot. And actually, that's one of the cool things about this. Up and all the things up until this point have been really been driven by people who needed something to power something else they were building, and they just released the thing that they needed to the world so they could use it. Um, so he is kind of the first person to bring promises and futures into JavaScript. Um, this is the core of async. He brings it in as deferred. He basically modeled it off of the async, uh, the twisted code. Um, it has a bunch of variables to handle various states, um, but the core ones are the fact that it has a results, it has a fired. Um, it also allows for chaining, which is really cool, and that kind of sets some of that. That inspires some of the ideas for promises A later on with venables and things like that. Um, so we've reached about. 2005, um, and we're already getting pretty close to what we know as promises today. Um, and then things kind of hang out for a little bit. Mochi gets rolled into Dojo. Um, people kind of use that for a little bit. Uh, jQuery is around. It isn't really using any of this stuff, um, which is annoying. And then in around 2009, 2010, uh, Common JS is really kind of picking up steam, and people are talking about Node and about uh, Narwhal and kind of trying to figure out how how to build a server using JavaScript and dealing with the fact that it's single threaded. And someone comes up with the idea that you can have promises and use this thing that was around in 1992 to deal with servers at architecture that needed events. Um, so in 2009, 2010, like three Chris's, which all spelled the same way, K-R-I-S, um, release proposals for promises. Um, there's Chris Kowal for, who, worked at, um, who worked on the Narwhal platform. Yeah, Chris Kowal, who worked on the Narwhal platform, he proposes promises B. Um, there's Chris Zip, who worked at Dojo, um, and he proposes promises A. And promises A is 
basically what the Moji Kit deferreds were, um, just kind of sort of refined a little bit um, throughout the years as they moved from Moji Kit to Dojo to then now going into Comma JS. Um, and there was also a promise to see that got proposed by Chris Walker, um, but that kind of very quickly just vanished into the nothings. Um, and then in 2010, Julian Alberg introduces deferreds into jQuery. Um, and this is actually <coughs> really, this is kind of kicked off the whole exploration into the history of promises. Because if you look at this, if you look at the thread on GitHub of him discussing yeah. deferreds, it starts this kind of, it wouldn't really call it like a flame war. This is a, it's a heated discussion about the difference between deferreds in jQuery and promises as they're defined in common JS. And Chris, I always get them mixed up. Um, pretty sure it's zip makes a bunch of comments about how if you made a few small tweaks, it would be great. And it would interrupt with common JS promises and like the world would be great. And that didn't happen. Um, there's this whole, he actually has this whole blog post kind of trying to defend his decision. But ultimately, if you ever want to work with jQuery deferred, the best thing you can do is kind of wrap them in a promise and then it'll work with everything else like you expect them to. Um, the, the, the major difference is that promises A, which is kind of the de facto promise A API standard at this point, um, uses a then callback with a success callback and an error callback in its parameters. And then you can chain those together and then at the end if you want, you can put a dot catch, which is just the error, uh, it's just the error callback. Um, this feels really clean to me, but it's also what I'm used to at this point, so maybe that has some kind of influence on it. Um, what Julian introduced was a, a syntax that had dot then with all of your success callbacks in one single uh, function call. Um, and then all of your error callbacks in a second one. And that was, I guess he preferred it that way. Um, it was fine, but it didn't work with promises A. Um, his solution was to release a library that kind of just converted between the two, just an adapter between promises J and promises A. Um, and so now you can just wrap promises J and promises A and then kind of move on with life. It would be really nice if someone at some point were like, hey, we're just going to put promises A into jQuery. If anyone wants to do that. There's a bug. There, is there a, a bug? Yeah, they're, they're, they're going to, once two uh, browsers uh, shift promises A plus, we just, uh, they were going to ship it. So that was a year ago. I'm not actually bothered to check. <laughs> right, so well, actually that might exist. That would be really cool. Um, it's one of those things where you're working with promises all the time, you hit the J like you get to jQuery, you start writing that then you chain them and like everything breaks. And you're like, why isn't this working? And you're like, oh it's jQuery. Um, so in 2012, Promises A kind of won out over all the other kinds of proposals. Um, promises B was a little too heavy and complicated. Promises Kiss kind of had the same issue. Um, so Promises A kind of took over and like just became the de facto. And then Promises A plus came out and refined the idea. Um, you end up with this interface that is really simple. Um, all you have is a dot then, you have a dot catch. Those are like the two major methods off of a promise. Um, every time you use a, promises are always chainable. Uh, if you're gonna use a dot then, you should be returning a promise. Um, just to make everything work with everything else. Um, this is kind of where we are now with promises. Um, they're super awesome. You should look into how they work if you aren't entirely sure. Um, I'm willing to talk to you about it if you are curious and have questions. Um, it's one of those things where you start to look at it and it feels like you're unraveling a knot with your brain. Um, but once you figure that part out, it all becomes pretty clear. Uh, one, I think, really interesting way to look, think about it is, like, one way that it, it, I imagine in my mind is, I don't know if any of you skydive, but there's the way that, like, the, the parachute is released is that there's, like, this set of cords and cables that all kind of link together. And you pull on one of them, the whole thing kind of just falls apart. Um, and promises are kind of like that. It looks really convoluted and weird, and like you have all these dot thens to connect with each other, um, and you're trying to unravel them and trying to figure out like what goes where. And 
once you pull that one little string, kind of all just like comes together and makes sense. Yeah. So it's the history of promises. Um, it goes back a lot farther than I realized. And we're kind of just reinventing the wheel at this point. Um, and actually, one of the really funny things is that if we So promises have been, there's a bunch of libraries out there now that implement uh, promises A plus. So if you ever need to use it in your application, you can just import one of them. Um, there are a lot of them. People have written many. And the best part is that someone wrote a library for promises in Python. So we kind of come full circle where you had this promises library in Python back in like 95 and 20 years later someone has implemented it again in python after it went through javascript um, that's pretty awesome <laughs> that's my talk um, that's my twitter if you guys want to talk about promises thanks and if anyone has questions So in JavaScript, in the new JavaScript, is it, is it Promises A plus? Yep. Yeah, uh, CommonJS is like kind of solidifying on um, Promises A plus, and I'm pretty sure the new specs they're using ESX is ESX moving towards it. Yeah. Oh, Safe person is doing There you go. Yes. Um, in the ESX, you have generators and the yield syntax. How do you think would that solve some problems that Promises solve, or would would prefer to use it more, or would that kind of make promises become a lot less relevant? I'm not sure. You, they aren't. They're complementary. They aren't substitutes. You use the way you use generators for async functions is by returning promises. Uh, generators are for control flow. They're for how you sort of structure your program, promises are for dealing with values you don't have yet. They're complementary and there's been a lot of <coughs> they're not at all at close to each other. They're the same thing. That's actually one of the really cool things about the path that promises have taken is that they kind of went from this thing that was really all about networking um, and then kind of shrunk over the years to become this really well encapsulated piece of functionality that really all it does is it says when this is done this is going to have a certain state and I will tell you about it and that's all it does like it doesn't encapsulate any other functionality and like you can just kind of drop that into whatever else you need um, that's really one of the coolest things about it is that like it's you can kind of watch it become better over the years as people figure out what it is it isn't necessary well, I mean, one of the things that's interesting, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly a back-end developer, is that, I mean, threads have been, this is what threads are, right? Like, yeah. The executor library in Java has been doing this for ever and day, and that's where where promises seem to have arrived, yeah. is where threads have been for a while. We figured it, it out about it. seems a little strange that, like, yeah. It's, it's one of those things that, like, as I work more and more with JavaScript, I realize that we're just kind of learning all the things that people have learned like 20 years ago and just kind of doing it all over again. Um, so I think one of the really interesting things about this is that if we can figure out what people have already done, we can kind of hopefully bootstrap some of that learning um, and not spend 20 years trying to like figure out how promises work. Um, especially where promises ended up, there's sort of an alternative history of continuation passing style, which doesn't take this path through networking, it's more where the then and else continue or then and else API that promises A landed on is very similar to that. If you track that history back, you can take that back almost a hundred years of mathematics. And I'm just I'm saying really yeah. much with what you just said, you're landing on this common abstraction which is existing in the Java Executor Library and all of these things, and it's really cool to see all those convergences. So it's really neat to see how yeah. this networking story landed there too. Yeah. It's, it's really awesome just seeing like what the little kernels that actually matter are as they kind of filter out through the years. Yes? So um, two things. People here talk about Java, and uh, actually um, Java actually only implemented promises in Java 8, which is the ability to chain uh, the uh, executions one to each other and then do uh, fail, succeed. That's one thing. The other thing, we're in 2015. 
that there are still a lot of libraries that don't have the promises built in there. It's mostly callbacks. For instance, Angular by the HTTP is callbacks, right? You need to go to REST Angular to, to do promises and stuff like that. What do you think in 2015, it's still not the, the base standard of everything that is asynchronous? I really think it should be. It makes all of this so much easier to deal with. I had to deal with this recently with the file API. And it, the entire thing is asynchronous. It uses callbacks, and it's awful. Um, but someone out there wrapped it with promises, and I was good to go. Um, you can just drop in whatever promise library you want, and then like, that's kind of the thing is like, yeah, it sucks, but you can also just kind of use whatever promise library is out there, drop it in, and be good to go. Um, it's really easy to wrap the callbacks, and you can kind of just do the whole thing in one sweep, and then just release it as a library for people to use. Yes? One of the problems that I find interesting is dealing with APIs that want to kind of adapt over potentially async or synchronous operations. So environments where something might be uh, locally available or you know available on a server or something. So it promises kind of makes sense in that sense, like you can immediately resolve something if you know that it's going to be there or not. Um, but at the same time, it kind of feels like you're kind of yielding to the more complex async uh, paradigm for something that could be simpler than synchronous. I don't know if that's something that you've had to deal with or. Um, where that might be, promises might be helpful. I don't know that I've ever had to kind of wrap a synchronous thing with an asynchronous function, but I could see that being useful in a case where you aren't entirely sure if you are always going to be synchronous. Um, just to kind of give yourself that safety, mm -hmm. it definitely seems useful. Nice. Okay. All right. Thank you. I mentioned yet that you should speak at Boston JS? <laughs> you should really consider speaking here at Boston JS at that forum. <laughs> That's it. That's all I have. There's nothing, there's no other clever slides in here. You should probably like go to that website now if you have your laptop out and be like, I want to talk about whatever, man. Robots? I don't know what the kids are into these days. <laughs> Coming up next, and I have no speaker notes, so I'm, I'm going to botch this um, and base everything just on the title. We have uh, Glebomidal. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> it's the Boston accent. It's hard to. Sure. <laughs> He's here to talk to us about performance profiling using Chrome code snippets. Thank you. Just to answer previous uh, questions, Angular 1.2, HTTP returns a promise, same as timeout returns a promise. Um, someone else, um, I think the difficulty with promises is that you have to stop thinking about return value, right? There's no return value. It's a promise, a statement, right? You have to do that then. So you have to think about chaining actions and somehow they'll get an argument. So I think that's the difficulty. Um, this is awful. It's as awful as it gets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I apologize. It's hard to see this. Um, my name is Gleb. I work at a cool company called Cantra. We're hiring. Um, we do financial analytics. And we have a huge Angular app with lots of widgets, lots of graphs. We hard, you know, not hard code. We code everything ourselves in D3. We have excellent people who can do this with their eyes closed. That's why sometimes it's not as good as it could be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thing about this app is that if you look at the tables at the bottom, it's financial data. So it could be one result or it could be 10,000. So the chart could be huge. There could be a lot of data coming. The, you know, the dump could have, actually, let me start a timer, 20 minutes. A lot of data could be there. 
At some point we hit a barrier, our app became very sluggish. A lot of people actually tell us, oh, it's just because you use Angular. Well, before that we used Backbone, it was a nightmare to program, no offense. We actually started looking at, into ways how to analyze the performance of an app and how to find the true bottlenecks. And as a course of that you know, exploration, we found a bunch of ways to improve the performance. I wrote quite successful blog post which became like, at some point it was number one if you Google Angular performance. One of the tools that I discovered while profiling this app are Chrome code snippets. Uh, this is apparently a little known feature. It's available right now. You don't have to install any canary or anything like that. These are like bookmark plots, but they're, they're much nicer and I'll show examples. I have a GitHub repo that overnight became very popular a bunch of code snippets for any anything you might want, especially for Angular uh, application. Um, I'm going to show an example using uh, an app that finds uh, Chrome snippets. But before I do that, let me just show an example. <coughs> so let's say this is a page, which is hard to see. And let's say I want to know, well, how fast does it load? You know, what's the time until the page starts loading to a first paint. The Chrome tabs, the blurry Chrome tabs <laughs> on the top, if you go to source tabs, has three sub tabs. Sources, which are all the sources that are loaded by the page. Then you have content scripts, which are all Chrome extensions, right? So if you install Chrome extensions, they'll appear right here. I have only two. And then the snippets. The snippets is the last tab, and you can create a new, new one. You give it a name, right? And you write you know, any JavaScript that you want. You press uh, Command Enter, and it executes, and it prints hi. It executes in the context of a page. So you have full access to anything on that particular page, which is very, very powerful. Um, in this case, let's say first paint. So there is a function that executes. It takes the Chrome performance structure and just computes the difference between you know load time, start load time versus first paint time. It tells me it's 0.7 seconds, right there. I always have code snippet. It's saved in my Chrome. I can close, reopen um, the Dev Tools. I can run it anywhere on any website. It works very nice. One nice thing compared to bookmark less is that you have full syntax highlighting, right? You don't have to minify code, and you can assume that you're running in a latest Chrome, which is huge, right? There is no cross-browser portability. It's always Chrome. Um, so as you can see, I have a bunch of uh, little snippets. Uh, you can take an uh, entire library. For example, I took this timing from uh, Adios money that takes the same structure that I just used to compute first uh, um, time to first paint. I can I just run it on this page and it tells me all the numbers, you know, how long the network requests took, you know, when the page actually done ready, event fired, everything. I can run it on any page, just like that. Uh, another cool li uh, library that you can find is PerfMap. So let's say that. Well, I have a couple of images here, right? Images is the biggest obstacle to your performance when the page loads, because images are expensive. Everyone tries to minify JavaScript and save a couple bytes and argues, oh, you're, you know, whatever. Backbone is 30K versus angle of 100K. And then they put the background image, which is like five megs, and then they just <laughs> Anyway, so on this particular page, if I run this uh, perf map, it highlights how long each image took me to download. So this uh, screenshot took almost a second, and another screenshot took more than a second. Anyway, code snippets are extremely useful. It's a whole file uh, with syntax highlighting just stored right there. So now that we know what they do, let's give an example of actually profiling an application. So I have a small app called Vanilla Primes. Um, it finds primes. So first hundred are right here, too very fast. 
I'm happy. I, I wrote this little JavaScript program. That's what you're su supposed to do. If you prototype and JavaScript is great, just try whatever is, works and is correct. Don't you know, optimize the performance. A lot of people say, well, promise is a slow compared to my for loop or my callback, so async.js. Do you really care about you know, one millisecond, especially if you don't know if you actually need that code? So 100 params, if that's all I need, works great. I spend you know, 10 minutes coding this app. What about 1,000 primes? Ooh, see, my browser is completely frozen. Browser is single loop, there is event loop. Not only every JavaScript piece runs in the same you know, event queue. My drawing, my callbacks, like even scrolling, works in the same single event. It's like a DMV with a single bathroom that everyone has to share. <laughs> anyway, so I have a problem. My code is slow. What do I do? Let me just put it here. Usually, I would take my code and I would say new date, you know, start equals new date, and then after I find you know whatever end primes, I say you know finished equals new date, and then they just print how long it took. Now that's unsustainable. Um, although I, I, I do like console log statements, they're my passion, but <laughs> let's be realistic. <laughs> In this case, I have a code snippet. What we're trying to do is we're trying to time how long n prime numbers takes. So let's go to my code snippets. And I have one called time method call. So if you look at this code, JavaScript makes it extremely easy to take a method on an object and then wrap it with our function that does something but calls the original method, okay? So if you put your application on an object, right, you can easily wrap your method in timing calls. In this case, I have an app called, an object called primes app, and when I click a button, it actually calls find first and primes. So this little snippet overrides it and wraps it in timing calls. And instead of using you know, new date, I'm using console, Time, which are Chrome specific calls. I'm in Chrome, so I'm allowed to use it. So I can run this code snippet. <coughs> it wrapped, you know, whatever I, I call here, and I click the button again. Okay, it takes almost eight seconds, and it actually restores the original method. I like to clean after myself. Um, like iframing things or running your JavaScript inside some other page, let's all be you know gentlemen, right? You can't just overwrite stuff, you know, change array prototype. It's, it's, it's frowned upon. <laughs> just timing a method is not enough. I don't know what exactly is the slow part. Why does it take eight seconds? So usually what I would do is I would go to profile tab and I would Click start, I would go click a button, and I would wait, and I would wait. <laughs> so right now I'm collecting JavaScript CPU profile. Um, you know, the Google team, okay, it finished, I go and click stop, I have a profile. Um, great, right? Now we can actually look at a bottleneck and see what's going on. When you have a large app where you have, for example, event handlers on scroll, on mouse hover, even trying to go and click a button becomes a problem because it runs so much else. So I would never get like clean you know, profile, like in this case, because this is a very simple app. I would always have a lot of noise. So I have another code snippet that specifically targets profiling, not even timing, you know, start and stop, but profiling a method execution. And it's here. It will profile the same call using console profile and console profile end. So I'm going to run this profile. I'm going to click this. And you know, it takes its eight seconds. OK, it's done. And now, if I look at profiles, I have very accurate 
picture of that particular method's execution. So this is a, a flame chart, right? It shows that I started running this anonymous function with my you know, click callback, then it went into and my overridden object, and then it ran on the, on the bottom. Find first primes, it ran for almost eight seconds, and then it called whole bunch find prime, and then this little execution of is prime. I can switch to from a chart to heavy, and it shows separate functions and how expensive they were, you know, from the most expensive to least expensive, and it shows the self-execution time. Because if a function calls another function and spends all the time there, it's not the first function's fault. Right? It's the second. Here's the great stuff. Chrome is great. Right? Not only it shows me you know, the, mo the function, but in aggregate, took the longest. It shows the little yellow sign. And if I hover, it shows. Oh. <laughs> 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 if I hover, I can't even read it there like myself. Ridiculous. Uh, it shows not optimized try catch statement. It actually shows me why the 8 engine cannot optimize that particular function. If I go there and I look at the code, it's a little function that was at the bottom. Each one took less than a millisecond, but the function is called is prime, and all it does. It looks at the number and checks if it's divisible cleanly by anything less than that number. So prime test. As you see, it has try catch block. That's absolutely unnecessary in this case. And because of this try catch block, V8 cannot optimize function with try catch blocks. Oh well. The V8 cannot optimize try catch blocks, so because of that, this function takes you know, almost five seconds. V8 has a lot of little things that it cannot optimize. You touch arguments, object, you're out, out of luck. Apparently, even if you modify the original separate arguments, like you know how you say, you know, foo, and it takes an argument bar, and you say bar equals bar or default value, you cannot do that. Yeah, that's right. If your function is longer than like certain limit, it will just stop optimizing it. Right? No, too long, probably too much, you know, things going on. Um, so this is an example. So let's see if we can solve it. Removed, try, catch. By the way, every talk should have a hidden Easter egg. Here's the Easter egg here. I need to reload my page. If I click and hold, Google Chrome shows, and it's hard to read, but it says normal reload, hard reload, or empty cache and hard reload. I don't care, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is prime no longer has try catch, but the only difference. I'm gonna say thousand. I'm gonna go to my code snippets. Second Easter egg or bonus Easter egg. If you look. For specific uh, source file, press Command O and start typing. Profile method call. Inside the file, if you press Command Shift O, all the function names, so you can jump right there. Okay. Instrument. Do, 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 do. Eight seconds. Okay, much faster. If I go to profiles. This particular code snippet, every time it runs, saves under the same name. So the profiler keeps it in a particular group. So it used to be that is prime ran for almost five seconds. And after we removed try catch, it ran for 0.8 milliseconds. The difference between a function that V8 optimizes and cannot optimize is an order of 10,000. It's ridiculous how this is even possible. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people, so I, I got, well, I did not get personally into Flame Awards, but a lot of people discuss AngularJS performance lately. And a lot of people say, well, here's React that implements maybe one tenth of Angular, and it's super fast. Okay. I guarantee that when you start profiling accurately, your application 
and you look at exact actual bottleneck, 90% of the time it will be on code first. Not Angular, not the digest cycle, none of it. It will be some little function that you never actually argued about. <laughs> when you argued about, oh, should we use array for each or do a for loop ourselves? Right? It will be something like this, where you use try catch just to be safe, and it actually screws up your performance. What else can you measure? So I have four minutes. Lots of things. Um, you can measure everything for Angular, how long a digest cycle, you know, number of watchers. You can also measure things like if you have an object, and it's a JSON object that you transmit, which key is expensive? Everyone says, well, just send a JSON, right? Because the JSON has full um, property names. Sometimes you'll find that your, your, your data takes only a small, small percentage, and the property names take a lot of space. So JSON is not the most optical um, storage format, and you can do this. Another thing where you can use code snippets that actually work out very well for demos and prototypes. Um, we've done uh, projects with, with clients, and the first day when we got there, we actually hacked into it, well, not hacked. We took a production website and wrote code snippet that if you execute on the production website, you know, redone everything and put our stuff like a frost and like, oh, here's integration working. This is what we can do. Works like magic. People are absolutely amazed that you can do this. Um, just to finish this, because I have only three minutes left, I want to go back and say, for this whole repo, you can look where are code snippets at different categories. And here's the, oh, here's the, the bonus. It's not Easter egg, this is actual bonus. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. And can ask people to vote. And I want to ask, what's the hardest problem in computer science? Who thinks it's naming things? <laughs> what are all the <laughs> OK, and then the second one, caching. OK, so naming things it is. No. <laughs> the answer is a secret option number three is iteration. Iteration as in doing the same thing. That's why we write automation, right? That's why you know there is make, you know, grunt, gulp, and all those things. It's we introduce complexity on purpose because it allows us to iterate. Think about Git. How much simpler it would be if I just send you a code once and I'm done. The whole purpose of a Git source control is to allow me to iterate and keep you sending updates and you send me back something. If we only had to do things once, it will throw away code, no problem. We introduce all this complexity just because we have to do the same thing over and over. Code snippets. It's not enough for me to actually create a code snippet. What if I publish a new version that's 10 times faster? All right. How do you do it? So here's a cool trick that I found out. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, obviously you can download the new code snippet and run every time, but that's, that's no, we don't want to do that. If you ever have to develop a Chrome extension or code snippet, undock it. I have one minute left. Okay, let's see if I can do it. Now, press option command again, like to, like if you were trying to open a new DevTools. Boom, you have new DevTools. What does it show? It's a DevTools for DevTools. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so if you ever have to de debug or develop a Chrome extension, that's what you do. You have to be in undock mode. It's like God's mode. <laughs> okay, you go to code snippets again. And let me just pop console and let's look at local storage in this case. Ooh. And I can maximize this. If you inspect the local storage for DevTools itself, it has everything. All the options, all the UI layouts, it saves it. How cool is that? They just use local storage. One particular entry is very interesting is, okay, 
amount of time, so is script snippet. It stores all the source code in a regular JSON block, just an array, by name and numeric ID, right there. See, ng count watch content taken from blah, blah, blah. So here's what we do. We have a code snippet to update code snippets. <laughs> and I had lots of choices, you know, how you want to update. In this case, if you have a code snippet, like time method called .js that actually matches anything in my GitHub uh, repo, then it, it will be updated. If you change the name, it will not update it. So let's run it. Again, it's just command uh, enter. So it tries to fetch everything by name, and obviously it fails for a bunch of stuff. But it actually updated um, four code snippets. One is legit update, because uh, a guy just did a pull request while I was sitting here. But everything else is. And then you can close DevTools. And you open them again, and you have new code snippets. So they can actually update something. <laughs> you can find the blog post that describes all the code snippets. Um, the, the blog post about Angular performance, <coughs> if someone asked a question about Angular, code snippets is right there. You can follow me, blah, blah, blah. You can follow uh, these guys from Google. They know what they're doing. They constantly <laughs> add new stuff. I used to be able to actually do the timeline um, of a method, you know, the same as I do the CPU profile. You could start timeline, but they changed the whole thing. It's now deprecated. I cannot start it, but it's pretty cool. It's got where it's going to. Uh, if you have a chance, so the guy who wrote Lodash as a fork of um, underscore, and uh, he's excellent. If you see his talks on performance, it gives a lot of insight. Um, if you want to work at Kensho, just drop me a note. We do cool stuff. Any questions? Yes. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, about uh, performance optimization, but this is very specific to Chrome. You know, um, yeah. removing the try catch in a different browser might not make a difference. Yeah. Right. Um, do you have any other tools for developing in like uh, <clears throat> IE8? <laughs> uh, so, good joke. Uh, <laughs> I, I always open a good joke and. Uh, Usually, I have to say I ate. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> no. So Microsoft has to get the you know act together and finally decide which browser they release, right? <laughs> and what's the engine? Um, my company traditionally has focused on Chrome first because it's the same as browser, and we're actually looking behind this into Canary and Service Workers that does crazy stuff that we actually need. Um, if a if specific user, based on the, our usage, targets, let's say, Safari, and comes and complains, we'll definitely look at that. I expect to be able to maybe copy-paste the code snippet and almost work. But we never had to deal with that um, just yet. Um, the cool thing from Chrome is that why I find this very interesting. They just released a project, well, there are a bunch of projects, but one is if you collect performance stats from different tools, you can send it to Chrome and plot it right there. So that was really cool. And second of all is you can start Chrome in like the remote debug mode and let's say profile your mobile device, which we think, or Node, which yeah. we think is, oh, I, well, I, sh I should say iOS 8, or io.js. So that's why we kind of stick with Chrome. I think ultimately Safari is considered right now the performance champion by, you know, by benchmarks. But I think Chrome just with their tools blows them out of the water. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Any thoughts on how to maintain or collect uh, kind of data over time uh, for, for a particular application? Say you want to you know, look at how different code yeah. versions change your performance in an automated fashion? I don't know what's going on here, but uh, you can export all the data from uh, Chrome tools and save it right for future. Uh, so I'll start with that. 
as far as r running the same kind of performance thing on the application, you know, for every build, um, I think it's possible. I, I haven't I haven't automated that, but I have a project for that. So we talk about iframes, and we talk about events, right? Um, I wrote a project that you can embed a website inside an iframe, and when you drop in what I call it, what was called iframe API, and when you have a bidirectional promise returning API, so you can say you know run this or do that, right? Whatever the website allows, and then you can time it and profile it, you know. But I, I'll be happy to actually do that. That's a cool use case, performance testing. Just don't do big. Okay, save yourself years of life and don't do micro benchmarks. They change every month. They're inconclusive, right? And the next minor patch of V8 changes everything, or Safari, or you know anything, or IE 10, 11 changes. So always profile live application. That's a lot more bank report. Thank you, guys. This has not been the easiest week for getting around town. Um, if we could do a quick show of hands, who here is super pumped for the 2024 Olympic Games <laughs> in Boston, Massachusetts, <laughs> using the same trains that were around during the blizzard of 78? Yes! <laughs> awesome. Yeah, seriously, we really appreciate you guys coming out. Um, you're of much sterner stuff than any New Yorker I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it goes without saying. Um, Science Club for Girls, similarly, I'm sure, appreciates it. And I hope to see all you guys at the next one. Thank you.